Welcome. Let's talk about responding to an AP literature and composition question to style prompt. Um, before we start, you should just pause this right now and look at the bottom of the page uh, that you're on, and you will see if you're and if you're not there, make sure you go to uh, video.metonymy.info and get the link to the PDF version of this um, prompt and selection. Uh, if you haven't read Heart of Darkness, uh, you should, and you should uh, you can find free online uh, versions, which is uh, where I got this. I'll, there's a link on the page as well, uh, because it is not under copyright. So um, if we look at this page, uh, you, the prompt is up here at the top. Analyze the literary techniques Conrad uses to characterize Kurtz in this excerpt from Section 2 of Heart of Darkness. There will also be background, a uh, sentence or two of background prior to this that says something like um, Heart of Darkness, uh, Marlowe, you know, the seaman Marlowe is uh, telling the story of his journey to the Congo to a group of uh, other sailors and uh, he discusses his experience traveling up the river uh, to find Mr. Kurtz, the ivory station trader, um, something along those lines. Okay, And here are three examples of the kinds of uh, prompts that you might see on the question, too. Uh, th this is the one we're going to focus on today, but we'll, go, we'll write a thesis for each, and you'll sort of see the difference. Uh, or um, the, the difference is pretty uh, minor. If you look at the first, it's very general. Analyze the, the literary techniques used to characterize. We want to definitely focus on this verb when we start writing. We want to write about Kurtz. Um, the second is uh, fairly common in the U.S. version of the text. How, test, I should say. How does Conrad uh, characterize Kurtz's complex character through literary techniques such as tone, point of view, and setting? They're going to give you sort of a focus for those literary techniques, and then you really need to delve deeply into describing this and, you know, focus on some of these and any others that, that bubble up to you, you see as being important. The third down here uh, is more similar, I think, to the, uh, and, and look, there are exceptions to this, but this is more common on the B form that we use overseas. How does Conrad use literary techniques to characterize his personal relationship to the land and the ivory trade? For example, they're going to give you a uh, sort of thematic focus, and that's something you need to, you know, take that gift and use, and then literary techniques is something you have to come up with on your own. Um, so this is, I would organize around describing this, and then any, using any literary techniques and selections from text as support as I went along. So we want to start with a good reading of the selection, obviously, that is definitely at least half of the battle here. So as I look at it, uh, immediately what I notice is here, uh, this section here, this is the narrator. This is not Marlowe. This is coming from elsewhere, uh, not from Marlowe's perspective. Um, there's lightness and darkness. We've got the flame, the match goes out. Uh, almost chiaroscuro. Look at the description of Marlowe. Is, is that uh, important? You know, um, it's a cause of profound stillness. And then look at the contrast here. Absurd, he cried. This is the worst of trying to tell... Here you all are, each uh, moored with two good addresses, like a hulk with two anchors, butcher around one corner, police around the other, excellent appetite, temperature normal, you hear normal from year's end to year's end, you say absurd. Um, he is sort of anticipating the audience response here. Uh, you know, think about Marlowe's tone here. Uh, how does it sound? Um, that's important. You know, his, his relationship to just the storytelling is important in this selection. So, in fact, if you look at this section here, we see uh, we learn about Kirsty, learning about Marlowe. Marlowe is, in this section, really upset that he may not be able to have the privilege of listening to Kurt, Kurt's um, you know, this paragon here. Uh, but, oh, I was wrong, the privilege was waiting for me. Uh, he, you know, he's a voice. He was very little more than a voice. Um, and all of this stuff about voices here. Um, the memory of that time itself lingers around me impalpable like a dying vibration of one immense jabber. Silly, atrocious, sort of savage, or simply mean. Voices, voices. Um, is a voice. So we're learning about that. Um, and we learned that he is a valued voice. That's something that Marlowe clearly is sharing with us here. 
So, Kurtz is little more than a voice, and if we look here, you know, there's just a weird bit about the intended, and uh, women should stay in their beautiful world, ours gets worse, uh, she had to be out of it, but then, look at this, you should have heard the disinterred body of Mr. Kurtz saying, my intended. The lofty frontal bone, they say the hair goes on growing sometimes, so here there's some, you know, this sort of metaphor or figurative language that Kurtz is, is like, he's really dead. I mean, disinterred like a, you know, a corpse has been dug up and the hair goes on growing after death. But this specimen was impressively bald. There is here a personification of setting that's important. It has uh, em loved him, embraced him, consumed his flesh, sealed his soul to its own by inconceivable ceremonies, some devilish initiation. Uh, you know, he is part of the setting and there is an evil there, uh, there is a, uh, a joining together of the two. So we can use that. Um, as we scroll down here, um, he's talking about fossil, ivory, all the ivory that he would find. He said, you should have heard him say my ivory. Oh yes, I heard him say my ivory, my station, my intended, everything belonged to him. This is description, part of Marlowe. And look at this. Look at the tone here as well. Um, it made me hold my breath in expectation of hearing the wilderness burst into a prodigious peal of laughter. All right. So again, setting. Obviously, you know something's going on here. Uh, everything belonged to him, but that was a trifle. What he doesn't understand is that he belongs. And Kurt himself belongs to the wilderness. Um, so the setting is super important here, obviously, and uh, there's this relationship between Kurtz and the setting. Okay, so as I look through here, uh, let's go back down to the prompt. So as I think then about uh, this first one, analyze literary techniques, what are the big ones I want to focus on? I want to focus on tone. Tone in two separate regards. Tone in terms of uh, Marla's view of Kurtz. As well as Marla's view of his audience, which includes the narrator. I need to describe these, right? It, you know, back in, you know, in sort of the setting of Marlowe's tale, he is just dying to hear this voice. Once he finds out about him, he gets, you know, sort of the his view of uh, Kurtz as sort of, you know, ironic. Here he is. He's, he's all powerful. He's um, he's you know his ownership of the wilderness, but in fact, who owns who? The wilderness owns him. We're learning about his character again. And then Marlowe's view of the audience is essentially that uh, it's, you know, this absurd. Of course they think it's absurd. They can't understand his story. Right. And there's something here about storytelling. Maybe I, maybe I get to this metafictional layer, but let's start with tone. Next, I want to talk about setting. I mean, obviously, the, the setting here is important as well. Okay, so let's think about the setting. Um, the relationship between Kurtz and setting. And that builds off of this idea of ownership. Whoops, he spelled that. Kurtz and setting. I can describe this. Um, it's consumptive. Let's see here. Maybe I want to start with setting now that I think about it. I, I probably do. Um, and so sort of tone setting, and if I can get to it, if I can get to it, this idea of uh, storytelling, metafiction, seems to be powerful. There's something about the voice and the frustration of uh, Marlowe. And we need to organize this then into a single thesis statement. Lots of ideas here. Okay, I look at these and think, what's the relationship between these things? How does he characterize Kurtz? Well, that's what we need to build on. We'll write that thesis. This will wind up being a plan of working conductively, and I can move forward to write.
So as we look here uh, at what we came up with in terms of thesis, uh, the, here and here are two possible theses. Conrad uses point of view, tone, and setting to characterize Kurtz as a shade totally infected by the horror of imperialism. This includes some uh, literary techniques that I am going to write about as I describe how this happens. Below, you see the thesis claim. Really, this is the piece that you must have. The three ideas that we're so used to writing in the thesis statements aren't necessarily uh, something that needs to be in the thesis. It come in a subsequent sentence. Conrad characterizes Kurtz as a shade or ghost or, you know, uh, the like, totally infected by the horror of imperialism. That is my thesis claim. Paragraph by paragraph, I need to come back to this. And what I've done here, you can see I've ordered, I'll talk about setting first, tone second, storytelling third, and I'm going to support this with details from the text. Ideally here, I've annotated the text, and that makes it really easy, as you see here, tone, narrator, which is going to you know, be point of view. Um, because I have this, uh, these details in uh, my annotation tone, again here, setting, I can come back very easily and get the details and use those details as I write. I want to support my thesis claim, again, here, based on text. As I go, paragraph by paragraph, I want to avoid a chronological walking through of the selection. I want idea-focused paragraphs. That's what this plan is all about. To a setting, tone, and then hopefully storytelling metafiction. Um, the idea is not A to B to C, beginning to end. Paragraphs are focused on ideas, ideas that all relate to our thesis claim. That's it, folks. That's what we do when we respond to a question two style prompt. So good luck. Have a good reading. Have uh, ideas to write about and a clear thesis claim that states um, an idea of your own, and you'll do great. All the best, and best of luck.